What's going on, guys? It's Frito here for your Overwatch. Blizzard just released a blog post confirming that the leaked patch notes were true and actually added an additional nerf on top of that. Went into depth of the reasons behind some of the nerfs, important because some of them are controversial. We know when this patch will come out, November 15th, and we know that Yiska's reporting, of course, was spot on. This was a patch that was in development to try to be in time for the Overwatch League Grand Finals Tournament coming next week. On top of that, the lead hero designer, who is the new guy in town, Alec Dawson, did a Q&A with Mr. X, which I don't think got too much publicity because it was so new and different from how they've done things in the past, but it was a Twitter space that I tuned into that gives a lot of insight through not just these specific hero changes, but their general goals with balance and what should we expect from the cadence of the seasonal model with when they'll be balancing what and why. We'll get into breaking all that down in just one second. Today's video sponsor is Manscaped. Over 6 million men trust Manscaped for their products like the Lawnmower 4.0, the best shaver in the business. But now they're going beyond the groin with the Plow 2.0 safety razor for your neck and beard. It's got a perfectly weighted brass handle and a zinc alloy head that makes precision super easy. Manscaped's always aiming for perfection. The cutting angle is designed to reduce razor burn and the materials are rust resistant. So you're really getting a quality product with this one. The gunmetal gray color looks cool with how much it weighs. It's just fun to use, to be honest. And you can get your Plow 2.0 replacement blades with your peak hygiene plan that's packed with a bunch of other great Manscaped products that I use every day. Get your replacement blades delivered right to your door, hassle-free, cancel anytime. They've also got the best way to store everything and travel with with it looks cool the shed travel bag is water resistant easily fits everything and a lot more with a stylish look and feel you can leave it in your bathroom or travel with it i bring mine everywhere pick yourself up a plow 2.0 and a peak hygiene plan by heading over to manscape.com and use our promo code overwatch at checkout to get 20 percent off your entire order and free shipping head over to manscape.com use promo code overwatch and get 20 percent off your entire order and free shipping so i'll be bouncing around between the blog post and the Twitter space to efficiently get through this information because of course we've already covered this patch but there's a lot of new stuff in here as well so they did say that they wanted to deploy this patch sooner but you know how development goes it needed to wait and the things that we should expect from the balance cadence is on a mid-season patch they're looking to tune back whatever is meta usually like four weeks in, and this will be reactive to the meta with not a lot of huge overhauls or reworks. This will be numbers tuning, tweaking cooldown numbers and breakpoints. But at the start of the season, that's where they're looking to go ham, I think. Tune up with a lot of buffs. Here in the mid-season patch, we've got like five nerfs. But at the start of next season, we should expect like maybe 10 buffs. And the aims for that is to change the play styles of the characters. Maybe look to change how you go about the cadence or the flow of how your hero interacts with the entire game. We might see reworks. And for example, one that like Aaron Keller mentioned before is that they had one for Brigida's ultimate, which right now is kind of a attritional ability over time. I'm willing to bet they give her some sort of impact play. That's going to be my guess because that's how they're designing a lot of the kits. But that's what we can expect at the start of the season. Reworks, big buffs, shake up the meta. And of course, next season we'll have a new hero anyway, which might do that to begin with. So we'll review quick the somber changes, shorter hack. You can't chain hack the same target anymore and a huge damage nerf to the hacked damage multiplier. It's now only 25%. Alec Dawson went into depth about this saying that Sombra in the beta felt too weak or her hack felt unimportant and hard to use, but now is a bit too strong and is dealing too much damage, especially to supports. This is an interesting thing that I'm happy to hear them communicate. A lot of these nerfs to single burst target damage dealers in this patch list are to help supports out. So if Sombra can too easily get a free kill on a defenseless support, or let's just say backliner, because I think it's sort of the case with a lot of flankable DPS too, but Zenyatta, of course, is the poster boy for the fodder for the new Sombra playstyle. And while they do want her to be more of a damage dealer and don't want her to be like the Overwatch 1 farm for your ult gameplay, which is kind of what Overwatch 1 was and what they're trying to get away from for Overwatch 2, 
They also don't want her to be too free and easy, I think, is maybe the word I'd use. And another term they used for different changes, and I, I think it probably applies to this one too, but to be more thoughtful in what you do. Because the more absolutely free matchups you have, you kind of can just run at those and not have to think about it. It's like, oh, they have a Zen, I'll spawn trap him and we'll win. That's not really cool gameplay, right? Like you want to be able to interact with it and make even smarter or bigger plays that feel more impressive. Like interrupting an enemy's ult with a hack is a play I love to make as Sombra. Free kills feel nice when you get the SR, but it's not like rewarding gameplay, right? And that's another thing that they brought up is like some of these things might not just be about the numbers tuning of what's performing where and trying to get all the heroes in line, but the gameplay feel, which is something very important to me, especially as we'll get into later. Some of these issues are kind of impossible problems to please all ranks. So you have to pick and choose your trade-offs. Where do I think this lands Sombra? I think she'll still be good in coordination with her team, which is still possible. Just not as good at getting free kills. My tip for you Sombra players, don't underestimate playing Sombra defensively, because oftentimes the game is incredibly flanky. Hacking a diver on your backline can let them use on a nade to really wipe that target out, combining abilities. I just feel no matter what, Sombra's got an applicable gameplay loop that she can do when she combos her abilities and can still be strong if you do that. Next change is to Genji, where a lot of players said this was a dumpstering nerf. Lower ammo, but more importantly, lower damage. You can no longer triple headshot melee. You'll have to combine a swift strike one shot a target but this again is an area where they're trying to help supports out a little bit now i'll say supports my best role so what i'm gm in and i'm working on some guides to try to help you guys out to see how much you actually can control when you put the game sense towards the position but i'll admit genji's tough to deal with especially when he has the potential to literally one tap you and a skilled genji can just get up close to you and do that pretty reliably in the twitter space mr x i think is quoting me something i said on group up genji is the best flanker by default in my opinion mainly because tracer got nerfed so hard and reaper's a little obvious although I think very strong, I think this kind of puts Genji in line with Reaper a bit, but still probably better because he traverses the map, has teamwork and does so many Genji things that are just good for the game. It's hard for me to imagine Genji being unplayable. And Alec Dawson said that the play data on Genji was incredibly loud. So I think that's why they're confident in such a nerf. Supports were struggling out there at every rank against Genji, which I think is the only time they start to look at health or damage, because those are the harshest nerfs you can give. I might be wrong on this one, but I think Genji's gameplay loop is one of the best in Overwatch. I don't think he needs to land that kind of niche one-shotting a support in order to function as a character. I think he's really good because I rate a lot of his value out of Swift Strike and actually reflect and his vertical mobility and his ultimate. That's the gameplay loop I'm talking about. I don't think Genji is a breakpoint type character and I don't think this even destroys any breakpoints. But hey, hey, what do I know? Just, just ignore me. I'm an old man on my porch. They also said in the Twitter space that they expect Moira's pick rate to drop a bit now that supports shouldn't insta burst to some of these threats. And I think these tank nerfs up ahead attribute to that as well. Moving on, Zarya, barrier duration reduced from 2.5 to 2 seconds and the cooldown from 10 to 11. The way Alec Dawson explained the Zarya nerfs is that playing against her, it felt like there wasn't windows of downtime to exploit her weaknesses because, well, the three bubble effect of the first one lasting long enough then you have a bit of health, then you have another one. And by that time, you probably have the third one up again. Zarya is just not killable if she maintains her bubble rotations properly. Although I think learning when you should break them in 5v5 is also an area that a lot of players haven't really discovered yet. I might get into this in my Reaper guide, but if she's already at high charge and she's out of position, but you think your team can kill her, burst the bubbles and actually kill her. I think a lot of people also get afraid and like, don't want to keep giving her charge, but it's really hard to see that window of when she actually can die, but it is possible to catch her out. Her base health isn't that impressive. It's the amount of bubbles that she has. So now that the duration of them goes down, it'll just straight up be easier to play around. You'll be able to wait it out better. You won't accidentally give her charge by thinking the bubble is going to go away in two seconds like it did for years, which I keep doing. So her average charge probably goes down over the course of the match. And a cool thing Alec Dawson said was it will make Zarya players need to be more thoughtful in how they use the ability, which I think is good for gameplay. The previous iteration was very spammy. D.Va, they said that it might not be easy to realize how strong D.Va is 
because Zarya is so strong anyway. And of course, has a strong matchup on the front line against D.Va, making it hard to outplay her. Possible, but not easy. So that's why we got the fusion spread reduced and the booster impact damage reduced. So these numbers, I think, really affect squishy targets. He's already good against Winston and probably still will be to fight him head to head. And he's so big. I mean, what difference does this make? Any of these numbers, but up against like a support, you might not burst them fast enough on your own. Maybe this is an area of interest to me because I think in the beta Diva had a difficult time competing against the other tanks, but then the buffs they gave her, I think made her too good against single targets in general. Like she sneezes on a Zen and it blows up kind of over the top. So all those above, I think were in the sentiment as they say of the support flanking and diving being too efficient and easy to do three of these characters are mobility characters and since Zarya was unpunishable I think she still kind of applies in the I can run at your backline most of the game and whereas I think a character like Orisa has gaps for you to exploit especially playing like Ana pressure out her cooldowns then land your abilities and you'll be able to take down Orisa Zarya it's the windows are too small and now that they opened up those windows I think there's a chance for supports to have a bigger impact in the game, which makes me excited because I was already enjoying the role, but they did put through one support nerf. This is a brand new one that wasn't in the leak. Kiriko's swift step in vulnerability duration has been reduced from 0.4 to 0.25 seconds. The devs say this invulnerability window is primarily intended to help avoid instantly dying to something unseen after teleporting through walls, but it ended up being a little too long and led to some confusion when shooting at Kiriko. Alec Dawson explained this a bit more where it just feels a little funny if Kiriko's able to teleport into danger and survive it. But in my experience, I usually see that get punished. Like I don't notice maybe what they're trying to fix here, but I do think the invulnerability frame is incredibly underrated. A lot of people forget how strong that can be playing Kiriko. Like you can save your swift step and a lot of times instead of using Suzu on yourself. It's sort of like you have two ways to escape, right? Because it's not just the mobility, you actually are invulnerable for a frame or a few. They went on to talk about a few other characters that are on the developer's radar. A lot of people asking about Doomfist. They say they want to give him a bit more of an identity after he lost the slowing effect on his slam. So instead, they want to look to something to alleviate his weaknesses. For example, is there a way to get more empowered punches in a match? So what? more frequent power blocks. I don't know how I feel about this. I think Doomfist being bad was like the developers putting him on a shelf so that the community doesn't have to be furious at how hard he is to play against when he's actually a good character. I think him having power gauntlet more often is really going to be oppressive. I'm not sure what they're going to do with that. I feel I know how to counter him. And when that day comes, we will have a guide waiting for you. But for now, he's a little too hard to play to get much out of. Very interesting comments about Sojourn. And the developers confirmed a lot of what I've been saying on this channel. Just from my observations, they said the data was strong. That Sojourn is a crazy pick masters and up but under that she is actually underperforming statistically which was to my expectation a lot of people give me weird looks for suggesting the average player should play soldier over sojourn but the reason is much more of your damage output is in easier to land damage than a railgun headshot most players are not going to achieve the skill floor to reach that output gap. And the data seems to back up that argument that they're divulging here. And so their answer to this is they maybe are looking to smooth out the gameplay a bit. It's a little boom or bust and mainly just for the higher skill players. And I'll just say my opinion, I hate seeing Sojourn all the time at the top level of play. I think it sucks. I think it's so much less interesting than Widow who has a lot more cost to her mobility in order to charge up to get a headshot. Soldier's gameplay loop at higher tiers just looks and feels lame to me. And that's what a lot of people felt about one shots in general, but I think it becomes more fair the more cost that your character has to invest. And well, spamming like a soldier to then get a railgun instead of a helix rocket, jumping over cover, it's just kind of nutty. The skill ceiling output you can get out of that. So I don't like it. And I think what they mean is by like smoothing it out and making her better at lower tiers, but worse at higher tiers, it's probably going to be something similar to what Jake suggested, which is to maybe she can't railgun headshot unless she has her ultimate. Would she still be a good character then? Maybe her primary fire has to be a bit better to compensate for the mid-range poke. And then she's just kind of much closer to the way Soldier feels most of the time. And the major difference is like the ultimate and the fact she can jump. But hey, we've got 35 characters 
characters in the game. This is what having ability overlap is going to look like a little bit, I think. Otherwise, you just turn a character into the Giga version of three other characters rather than an alternate of one of the playstyles. Guys, let me know what you think about the upcoming patch. Remember, this one's coming out November 15th, which is a ways away, but it will be what the Overwatch League plays on this next week. Be sure to check out today's video sponsor, Manscaped. Use our code Overwatch at checkout, like the video, and hit subscribe and the bell icon to actually get notified when our videos come out. I've been Frito for your Overwatch. I'll see you guys next time.